Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's great to see so many faces um, looking back at us from across the city and the region, so welcome. Um, I, my name's Jane Marnie. I'm one of the project organisers for the Amazing Place competition. And um, with me today, we've got Don Miskell, uh, who um, Becca will introduce shortly, and Becca McGeorge, who's been also involved in the project organising team for the competition from the word go. Uh, we were hoping to have one of our um, sponsors, uh, BNZ, here today, but unfortunately he's unwell. He's sent his apologies. But um, nevertheless, we will kick off. Over to you, Becca. Thank you, Jane. So thank you again for joining in today. It's really fantastic to use this tool. Um, it's a first for me, so forgive me if I'm speaking too quietly or screaming at you. Um, so these seminars, we've got several coming to you, and we've got some experts who will be talking about their fields. It'll be awesome, I hope, basically, to get their insights into I guess why they've done well, um, things that they can offer you in terms of advice. Um, so that should be fantastic. They are for you. So if you see that there are experts that you would like to hear from, please let us know and we're more than happy to try and track them down. Um, and if you have any questions but you aren't able to make these sessions, you can send them to our email address, which is info at theamazingplace.co.nz, um, and we'll ask them on your behalf. And then these seminars will be put on our website afterwards so that you can tune in uh, just in case you miss them or pass them on to people that you, you know, who might be interested. So in terms of um, who we've got talking to us today, Don Miskell is the General Manager of Design and Planning at CCDU, which is the Christchurch Central Development Unit, um, and he led the Blueprint 100 team last year, and they put together the Blueprint and the Christchurch Central Recovery Plan, which you may have studied. Um, so he will talk to us about his experiences. For the last 37 years, he's been a designer and master planner, predominantly with Boffer Miskell, so he's got some awesome things to share with us, and I'll pass you to him now. Don. Thanks, Becca. Uh, welcome, folks. It's really a great assignment and project that you got in front of you. It all makes, makes me wish that I was back at school doing the same. And for the, for the last, as Becca said, for the last 30 odd years, I have been working in teams on planning and design projects. And it's been a dream job, I'd have to say, that people who've watched me work don't know whether I'm playing or working. And that's the great thing about design and planning, that you can put your whole self into it, your intellectual part of your being and your creative part and your management and your uh, relationship building. So the whole person is involved in, this, in these projects. And I'd, I'd like to give you a brief rundown today on, on some key points about the blueprint and also offer you some tips around how you organise yourselves in teams on design projects, such as the one that you have, the amazing place that you have before you. So Richard, if you wouldn't mind just clicking us onto the presentation, we'll, we'll begin. So you're in control. Well, right, folks, so today, as I said, I want to talk about Two things. Did you say up? Up, down, down, uh, down, down, down. <laughs> so. Right. So I want to talk about the blueprint first, tell you about the key drivers, what was behind it, describe some of the anchor projects, why we located uh, projects where they are, and then I want to talk about how you might want to go about organising your process and planning your, your time on this project. So the first thing, way back in May last year we got the job to pre prepare a blueprint which was really a high level planning and design framework for the city and we had to, we had to do it in a hundred days and in fact we had less than that because we started on day 23 and we had to have a plan to the minister on day 65. But we didn't start from scratch. The city council had run this amazing, really quite an amazing process to actually ask people, the, the citizens of Christchurch and Canterbury, 
How do you want the new city to look like? What are the, th what are the things that are important to you? And they got 106,000 ideas, and they really brought them down into five key drivers, as I call them. So from these 106,000 ideas, they brought them down into five, and they said, look, we want a compact city, we want a green city, we want a distinctive city. We're Christchurch. We're on a flat landscape. We're, we have a rural hinterland. We've got high water tables. We're not Singapore. We're not London. We're not New York. So we want to... We've got a shared history for, of our Naitahu uh, settlers, then the European settlers have come in, so we want, it, we want the city to reflect this cultural heritage and natural heritage. We want an accessible city. We want to make it easy to get around and we want it safe. And also, and finally, and most importantly, we want it to be a people place. And what I mean by that, and what the people of Christchurch were saying is, we want the central city to be a great place to live. We want it to be a safe place. We want it a place where it's vibrant. Christchurch Girls High School has joined the conference. The there were 7,000 people living in the, in the central city between what we know as the four avenues. We want, to make, we want to make it so attractive that we get 20,000 people living in here. We want people to come and visit. We want people to come and study. We want people to live. We want to set up businesses and invest. So that's what I mean. It's an attractive place because where the people go, the businesses go. So here, so we came up with this blueprint, and one of the first things that we found was that there was too much space. We lost 70% of our buildings in the commercial and uh, core of the city. 70% of them had to come down or, or, or fell down. So we had too much space. And the people of Christchurch had already said, we want a compact city. So the first thing we did was create that frame. And you can see we've got it coloured in on the east of the core. You'll see, you can see that the, there's a north-south. So the north is at the top of the page. And then we've got a south frame. Over to the left-hand side of the picture, we've got Hagley Park, which is to the west. That orange colour uh, adjacent to Hagley Park is the hospital. And we've also got a health precinct uh, located there. So the big move was an east frame a south fr and a south frame. And what, what we were saying was, if you want to have a, an office or hospitality or a hotel, go into the core. So we've reduced the size. Because what people told us after the earthquake, they were said, look, we'd love to bring 500 people back to the city centre and bring our people back. We were scattered all over the city in our little offices. We'd like to all come back into one. Um, but we don't want to be in a building site for decades. So we had to try and get a sense of completion and so that people don't have to work in a building site. And hence we have actually taken land effectively out of supply and said that develop in the core. Develop around Cathedral Square, develop around the retail precinct, which is, you know, around Ballantines. And so we've, we've also, because we wanted people to live in the city... As, uh, as many people as possible, we changed the zoning so that we've said other than in Hagley Park and along the river, you can, you can actually build a house and live pretty well anywhere in the city centre. So we've actually we've removed the hurdles to, to, uh, to people coming to, to, uh, to live in the city. Now, you may, some of you may know of where the convention centre used to be. It used to be on the north side of Kilmore Street. And when we had conventions, people would... People would come to Christchurch, and they were they would would never shop. You know, they, kept, they visit, we had visitors who came to conventions, but because of where the convention centre was, it was further away from the city core. So people didn't come down into the retail precinct, and they didn't go shopping and buy shoes and bags or uh, or or whatever that we often do. We often shop when we're on holiday or when we're not in our normal working situation. So what we've done is bring the convention centre in close to the core and we've actually anchored it into Cathedral Square, which was the civic heart of the city. We've also linked it into Victoria Square and it used to be called Market Square in the early days and adjacent to the river. So when you've got photographs of our convention centre, it'll be it's surrounded by open space and good spaces. Now, interestingly, we had, we had to look at a whole range of potential sites, and we looked at all these, uh, a number of sites within the, in the, within the four avenues where, where we would locate the 
Convention Centre and we came up with some criteria that we, we tested. We also said, how big should it be? And we, Christchurch is New Zealand's second biggest city. Auckland is getting a convention centre that's three, for 3,000 people. Queenstown for what, have got a convention centre they're planning for 1,000 people. So we've said, OK, let's size it about in the middle. So it's, we've, we've settled on 2,000 people. And we've also designed it so that you can have three convention centres, three con, sorry, three events going on at once. So you might have one at 2,000, or you might have one at 1,000 and two at 500. So we, tr we had to build in some flexibility. We also, after the earthquake, we found that the police station was wrecked, and the police and the emergency services, the fire, the ambulance, and so on, had to coordinate, and civil defence, had to coordinate their activities. So we've decided to actually come up with a, a justice and emergency precinct, which you'll see in the middle of the picture to the towards the south along Chewham Street. So we asked the police. So when we were designing it, you actually asked the users. Um, we said to the police, where would you like to be located in the, new, in the new city? Because your building is wrecked and it has to come down. And they told us that they would like to... Um, they would like to be... The police said they'd like to be near the bus exchange because they, in the past they've had a lot of trouble and a lot of unrest um, and bullying and fighting and going on. In the, uh, and they, they, get, they used to get called out to the bus exchange, which was... And on Colombo Street, as some of you will know, they, you'd be users of the bus exchange. So the police said, put us close to the bus exchange. Also put it low, close to the late night drinking establishments. Because often at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, we get called in to actually sort out the, the disorder that goes on when people have had too much to drink. And so you'll see, if you, if you study the blueprint plan, that we put the police station actually right next door to the bus exchange which is right next door to the late night drinking, which was the old Seoul Square. And it's also near the hospital, which was another consideration. We've also got the courts in there, and we asked the judges, what do you want? And they said, we'd like to have a nice view of the river. <laughs> you know, so, so when you're designing, you think about the users, and you think about what their needs are so that you can, uh, you can accommodate them. Now, look, if any of you got any questions, feel free to ask them as we go. Um, the other thing we said was that what, let us make a big deal about the Avon River precinct because the Avon River is Christchurch's waterfront. So let's play it up and let's, do, let's make it an attractive catalyst for development either side. So let's enhance the amenity, let's put some paths in there that are well lit and safe so that people can actually feel comfortable using the walkways and cycleways through day or night. Now, if you look at the east frame, I, uh, we said that we wanted to have, which is that green area east of the core, we wanted to have people living in the, living, coming and living in the central city. So what we've got, while it looks green on the map, the underlying zoning, so you geography students will know that in town planning and, and resource management, there is a district plan. And, in the, so, and, and district plans have zones. So underneath the zoning for the east frame is central city business. And so when the city wants to expand, we can actually develop that area. So the government, the, we had to go up to Cabinet and we said to Mr Brownlee and the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister, can you give us some money, a big sum of money, so that we can actually buy this land and hold it in reserve until we need to expand it. And so what we are deciding to do since the blueprint is let's put some housing and residential in that east frame and down the middle of the east frame let's have a park with cycleways and walkways and make it attractive for people to build a house nearby and to be able to walk to work. So that if you're living in the east frame, say along Manchester Street or near to Manchester Street, you've only got 200 metres to walk to the Cathedral Square. You know, so it is, it's, it's making it easy and attractive for people to live there. We've also got um, other anchor projects around, but I, um, we've like, like the sports, uh, Metro Sports Facility in the lower um, west, that's lower left, that's in blue. And that was really to replace what we lost at QE2 other than the, the athletic stadium. And the reason that we put it down there was there are 7,000 people who, who work at the hospital. 
So it's a good location, and it's also close to the city core, and it's also got, um, it had the old breweries on it. So we could actually, the Crown is buying up the, the brewery site and the other land around, and they'll build the swimming pools, the gymnasiums, the movement um, the movement centre, which is going to be a world first, where movement and sports are going to be in one complex. So it's going to be easy for people to at lunchtime to pop down, have a swim, or if you're um, in the hospital and you work in the hospital and you can hop down, go to the gym during your lunch break or something like that. The other great thing that we're seeing is in the health precinct, which is that area in the middle left adjacent to the hospital, as part of the south frame. And what we're saying there is, let's expand the health facilities from public and private. And we, we've, got an int we've got interest from Otago University, Canterbury University, who teach health and you know, postgraduate medicine. That we've got the people at CPIT, the great CEO of CPIT, Kay, is saying, let's see if we could move the nursing training back up closer to the hospital, or at least part of it, the training, so they've got some options. They've got to decide on whether it's all nursing or part, uh, or, you know, the, the postgraduate nursing. But let's all take them up there. We've got scarce resources, so let's see if we can't come up with some creative and innovative solutions around sharing lecture theatres. You know, does Otago, Canterbury, CPIT all need their own lecture theatres, or can we actually share the facility and then maybe the GPs at night who come in and want to do some um, professional development they can come in and use the lecture theatres at night and then we can have the private sector coming in as well around drug trials clinical trials and so on so it's pretty exciting there's some great innovations out of adversity that are cut, growing out of the blueprint so that's May probably we enough on that we'll, um, let's get into the I've got a question oh sorry question Thank you. From Morihau High School, um, just two questions really. In this competition with our teams, should we be um, advising our students exactly where to locate their anchor project uh, within the frame, or do they just design their project and then not try and specify which street corner? That's my first question. I'll just let you answer that first, thanks. Well, for my... From my point of view as a designer, I think it would be, uh, I think we should let the students um, let their creativity and judgment decide where they would like to put, locate um, any anchor project. So if you, if you think we've got it wrong, you know, tell us. And tell us why. Because it is a matter of judgment. It's not necessarily, there's never ever one answer to any question. There's always a range of answers. So when I get on to the next stage of talking with you, I'll be suggesting that you come up with a lot of options and evaluate them and then choose based on the criteria that you come up with. Because it's your Thank city. You. The second question is, um, the Metro Sports Facility is an, sort of an encompassing type thing. It's got a variety of things that it may have. But then some of my students and their teams have got elements that could be under that roof, but as a separate thing, they'd want that activity to go within the frame. Now, is that still okay? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Yeah. That's your plan. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Any other questions about the blueprint before um, Don moves on to talk more about um, teams and um, putting together project teams? <laughs> Okay, Richard, should we? Yeah, we're going to go back to the presentation. <laughs> I don't know if we're even logged into the system. I think we're just receive, receiving, but we're not, we're not properly like. Oh, okay. So they can't see. Yeah. Can we answer that they are? Yeah, yeah just, just hmm. tell them we can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> oh, cool. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, look, uh, now let's move on to designing your amazing place. And uh, I've got some advice for you, uh, really. Our dream really is to make Christchurch one of the great small cities of the world. So you and your imagination and 
think about, and, and it really has to be attractive to people of all ages. So you, you, and it's all about people. It's all about people. So, and what are, you think about some of the things that you would like to have in a city that would be, would attract you to live there, to visit, to shop, to be entertained. So it really is about safety, it's about excitement, and it's also about business opportunities because if there's lots of people in coming to the city, then people will, businesses will want to set up there. And do you know, within the Christchurch city itself before the earthquake, 70% of the economic activity that, was, that came out of Christchurch City, so that's not Canterbury, it's not counting the farming hinterland, but just in the city itself, 70% of that economic activity that was generated came out of offices. So it came out of people's head, it was in the, the professional services firms and the, and, the, and, and the schools that we had in the city. So that was the, you know, so... Okay. Accommodating offices is really important. Hospitality and tourism, or sorry, hospitality and hotels, was only about 8%. So it's actually, it's, it's really quite an 8% of the economic activity. So um, think about business opportunities as well, because people will provide us with services, whether they're the lawyers, doctors, um, accountants, um, barbers, hairdressers, dry cleaners, you know, every... Fast food, slow food, all that kind of stuff. Okay, the design process. Now, I always think about design as a process. And it's not a linear process that goes from A to B. It's always a loop process. You, you make a bit of headway, then you have to go back and recheck. But you always should um, have a... Have a have an end goal in mind and so I I suggest to you for those of you who haven't started or if or on or you're partly down the track think about the design process in five kind of discrete steps even though it, it actually never you're never stopping and starting it's a, it's a it's a continuum but if you want to break it up it's, so you've got to get started you've got to which I'll go into in a bit more detail in each of them. But that's kind of working out, okay, what are the situations here? What are the opportunities? What's the site? And then you look, and then you gather, as I said before, looking at what are the preliminary options to solve this problem we've got. Christchurch Girls High has left the conference. Okay, so preliminary options, and then, then you've got to evaluate the options. You've got to think about, you've got to make a decision, which one will we go with? And it's often it's quite hard to do because there's never a perfect option. You're always doing trade-offs. And so if you have a nice clear set of evaluation criteria, then that's a big help. And then finally, putting your presentation together. And I find in all my 30 odd years of work that we often spend all our time in those top four and forget about allowing enough time for that fifth and important one particularly around a competition, but really when you're presenting plans to, to, to anybody, you have to have a well thought through presentation, eliminate spelling mistakes. I remember I used to, I had lecturers who used, lecturers who used to say, used to pick us up on spelling mistakes, and I used to think, why does it matter? It really matters, because when people, when it's badly expressed, ambiguous, you know, you're not getting your message across. So you, it's all about selling your presentation. So... Uh, it is very important that you allow enough time to your team to put your presentation together and make it convincing. Eliminate the errors, improve the clarity. So when you're getting started, let's go. What do you, the, the first thing you have to do is select a team, and it's really important. Has joined the conference. Welcome back, um, Girls High. We're, we're now just at the start uh, of, of a design process, and I'm just going through a, a few uh, hints. First of all, selecting a team. It's really important to attract a diversity of people. You know, when you're in any team that you have people with different specialties, you know, if it's in a sports team, you might have your goal shoot, your goal defence, or your front row, or your fleet-footed backs, or whatever. So everybody brings something personal and important to the team. So when you're selecting a team... Has left the conference. Sure you've got it. Make sure you've got a diversity of specialists, 
Make sure that you've got some leaders in there. Now, leaders are the people who coordinate and set directions and have the confidence and trust of the other team members. And they are thoughtful, respectful, they listen, and they actually take you forward. So it's really important that you have a... You also have some people who are really good at coming up with creative ideas. Really, and then they get a bit bored. So it's important to complement your creative thinkers with people who are really who are complete finishers, people who like to who are concerned about the details, and and also people who who actually are good judges of what's right and wrong or what could be better. So that you have creative people, you have good writers, you have good drawers, you have people with geography backgrounds. Science, economics, and all that, and then you and you form your team. And it's really important that you you realise that no one team member is more important than the other. That's a real secret for for effective teams. Everybody brings something different to, and important to the table, and everybody is, should be mutually accountable for the outcomes. You know, so the difference between a group and a team is that teams are mutually accountable. So when you select your team, you select your coordinators, and then you select your project, and then you have to make a a plan and a timetable, you know, and and so part of it is that you might find that that um, process slide that I showed you, that might be the bones of a plan, and then you can put some time to it, and I'll actually suggest how you might allocate your your time in, in the last slide, or the second to last slide. And then you allocate out the responsibilities, you draw up your contracts. So that's, that's, that's the sort of thing you do at the start of any project, really. It's, you know, like if you have a contract with your clients, in this case, you've got a contract amongst yourselves. Really important that you get clarity around uh, the, the beginning. The discovery phase, which is often the exciting bit, you know, the first thing you have to do is do some research. So make sure that in your team you've got people who actually are good readers and actually have good retention and can make judgments about what's important and what's not, you know, and, and that they're diligent and they read the recovery plan and understand it. You might, first of all, you might do a scan read and then you read for detail, pick out what's important. It's really important that you go and visit the site and the surrounding area and you understand. Remember we said we want a distinctive city, you know, so actually, you know, get familiar with the site. Know which roads come from where. Is it one way? Is it two way? What are the uses and activities around it so that you can actually um, have a real good understanding? So it's really important that you understand the site. Then you go out and you gather information. You might get on the internet and you might look at, I don't know what subject you're doing, you might look up stadiums and wh- where are the stadiums around the world and what are, they, what are they made of and what are the differences about them and what things capture your imagination. So research precedence is really important so that you get you know you can it, often it it helps it gets your creative juices going and it doesn't mean you have to copy them in fact what we're after is your own creative solution that you've developed yourselves but there's no harm in seeing what other people have done and you can learn off them it's no use reinventing the wheel then you sort out there you define the problem what is the problem as you see it you know what are the key things that you have to do clarify your objectives Go around talking to people. You know, if it's uh, if it's a um, if it's a housing area you're doing, go and talk to people who are investors or developers or builders, or um, or and, and talk to people who might live in the city. You know, do they want apartments? Do they want gardens and things like that? So that you get a real good understanding of the users. And then we we call this the discovery phase, and it's the interesting phase where you actually. Send all the team out and, 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 and gather information. And then you start, look, you take all this wide lot of information, and then the key is to be able to then synthesize it down into some ideas. Okay. Um, cool. Brainstorm some ideas, you know, and try and, and it's really hard for designers to go from information gathering to actually synthesis of some options. So look, um, be bold, and actually it's way better to start somewhere than, than muck around and not actually settle on something. So start somewhere, no such thing as a dumb idea. Just bring all those ideas to the table, filter them out, see if you can get three or four or five or sol- potential solutions, put them up and, and so that you've, you can describe them, illustrate them, and maybe you'll even split up the responsibility. Morning High School. 
has left the conference. Then the next step, once you've got those three options, then you have to you start evaluating them, you know, and it's really important that you actually come up with some assessment criteria. Now there's some assessment criteria that the judges are going to be using in this competition, but for you as designers, you have to come up and identify what's important to you. You know, what are the user benefits? Is the site suitable, you know, when you're comparing sites? Are there any fatal flaws here that you might have to go back to the start? And sometimes you have to do that, you know, because you go down a track and then you hit a brick wall and you've got to go back to the start. That's why it's important that you have a few options up your sleeve, excuse me, that you can go back to. You know, has it got, will it, will it have the community support? And how do you know it will have community support? Or well, ask people. You know, the wisdom of the crowd is way better than any single individual's idea. So actually test them out or get on your peers, your parents, or anyone that you can find to help, you know, so that you get the feel for, um, is this going to be a flyer or not? You know, if we decided to put, for example, the uh, Metro Sports in, the, um, in Hagley Park, which was what some of the sports uh, people wanted to do when we were doing the blueprint, we knew that the community would said no, you know, and so we took you take those kind of things into account. You look at the environmental input, impact, and that could be both positive and negative. For example, in the river precinct that we're doing, that we've just started on the preliminary design of that now, and we've got the storm water systems that we've got in the south frame, uh, east frame, sorry, flowing back towards the river, and we're actually cleaning the water in um, in swales. So the water comes off the car parks, the roads, goes through swales, and is cleansed but, uh, to a certain extent before it hits the river. So that what we're trying to do is make the river a great environment for the inanga. Uh, so if, if we've done a good job on the river precinct and we've improved the water quality, you know, the fish come back, the trout come back. Also, think about the wow factor. What's going to what is going to excite the community, excite the judges? And also, it's got to be tinged with some financial feasibility. Is this going to stack up or not? You know, And often, the, the greatest ideas, sometimes you can make them fly and you make them happen. But you have to have an awareness of general costs. So are people going to be able to afford to pay high rents in the houses, huge rents You know that they pay in Los Angeles and Tokyo? No. It's, this is Christchurch, and we pay we pay Austra uh, we pay Christchurch rates. So you, you you develop your assessment criteria criteria, assess your op options, and then select your favoured one. And then once you've selected the favoured one, then you start putting this presentation together. You and you can explain it. It's like a selling document. So you have to sell this to the judges, sell this to your colleagues and your friends. You know. So you need diagrams, you need maps, you need models to make it clear what your proposal is. You need a good arguments about why this is such a great proposal. You know, so that you look at the pros and cons. And as I said, there's never, there's never all pros and no cons. There's always a few, and you're best to put them up and actually say, but in our judgment, we've gone with this one because we think the pros outweigh the cons. Proofread your port. Make sure there's a series of drafts. Use your best writers, your best drawers, your best, um, you know, your best proofreaders, and keep refining and improving until final production. But as I said, make sure you give yourself plenty of time. So how do you allocate time? Well, I'm suggesting here, the, the, here is a, a diagram that you might want to refer to that you might find helpful. Getting started, about 10% of your time. The discovery phase, 25%. Generating all these ideas and options, 25%. Evaluating them about 15 And then you'll see I've got 25% that much in, in putting your presentation together. So that you, you don't have to take this... Uh, as gospel, but in my experience, that's kind of what works. So, and finally, good luck. You know, we hope that you have a great and amazing time preparing your amazing place, and we really, really look forward to your plans. So, thank you very much, and best wishes.